So today we're going to focus on, on the synthetic side, the synthetic polymers and fibers that we have. We talked about natural fibers last time. And so we'll go through a lot of polymer terminology because the chemistry related to polymers is, is buried in the names of the polymers. Uh, we'll show you some of the, the growth mechanisms for the polymers, mainly just so you have the, the, the different types of polymer growth mechanisms. I'm not going to be asked to repeat those, but it's just to refamiliarize yourself with them or if you've never been introduced to them, to show them to you. There is a polymers course now, the ACS certification of the degree for the um, for our department. They have added polymers a few years ago. so. Dr. Hobbs is teaching that polymers class, but not everybody's had it. So if you've not had the polymers class, today's kind of like a mini version of that class. And I'm sure he would have things to say. It's not too in depth, okay? All right, so here's the outline. We're gonna go over polymer basics again with the terminology, talk about the synthetic polymers and the different growth mechanisms. We're gonna talk about super glue because that has forensic applicability um, in developing fingerprints and other kinds of pattern evidence and then the, the different properties of the synthetic polymers, the processing and fabrication. So <clears throat> when we get fiber evidence, what we want to first do is classify it. Is it a biopolymer? Is it a synthetic organic polymer? Is it some semi-synthetic? So it's like a natural source, but then it's been uh, taken through some sort of semi-synthetic process like, like rayon or cellophane. So today we're on, on the synthetic organic side. And I noticed too that just from working with the microscopes and fluorescence, that a lot of the biopolymers will fluoresce and a lot of the synthetic polymers will not. It's not a hard and fast rule, but if you're trying to find biological evidence, skin cells, hair, stuff like that, hit it with a black light. You know, put, put your orange glasses on to block the blue, shine your UV light on there, and the skin cells and the hair follicles and stuff will, will pop out and fluoresce. And so you can pick those out with the tweezers. The remaining evidence may still be uh, biological, but, but it, it could also be synthetic. So let's look at the different kinds of synthetic organic polymers that we have. So going back to our polymer terminology, most all of these uh, <clears throat> synthetic polymers are going to have some sort of double bond item that's going to be the, the locus of our polymerization. We talked about the difference between random block and alternating polymers last time and grafting. So let's get into the different monomers. So we have these mechanical properties that are dependent upon how the polymers are fused together or, or stacked. And we talked about the temperature response and crystallinity. So I wanted to show this example shot from a video in the past, but, but here we have uh, the liquid nitrogen. Let's get it over here so the people on the video can see. Okay, so this is liquid nitrogen, and this is always kind of fun. Um, this liquid nitrogen is at 77 Kelvin. Yeah, that's cold. Okay, it, what, is the, what is our room temperature? Come on, give us. 298, right? Like freezing water, like ice water is 273. So 77 to 277, that's 200 degrees difference. So this tube is 200 degrees hotter than that liquid nitrogen. So it would be like taking a, like a glowing hot red steel tube and sticking it in water, okay? What's it gonna do? It's gonna boil as soon as that hot material hits the water. Now, uh, when you have boiling water in a metal tube, have y'all, <laughs> this is ancient. I mean, this is, so we have Keurigs now, right? Then we had the drip, like previous to that, the drip copy makers. Previous to that, we had percolators. Okay, you got a little boiling element in the bottom and you got a metal tube. And so the boiling liquid going through the metal tube would, would like the straw effect would, would push liquid, hot liquid up the tube. Okay, boiling liquid and a tube. You see it? I don't know if you can see that. I can see it. You want to come look that closer? There. Get some on you. <laughs> Did you, do you hear it coming out? Let's, like, can, let's do it again. Let's switch sides. I'm gonna keep my the cold in in this. Thing. There, you can see the shadow. You see the shadow. So it's cooling that tube down. 
quite quite fast. Okay. And so in this properties here, we're below the glass transition temperature, way below the glass transition temperature. I'm going to grab the cold end here. Here. The flexible polymer, it's a glass. Yeah, it can shatter, but I'll do that later. <laughs> Now, how can I have something that's 200 degrees colder than room temperature in a glass container? You didn't take thermodynamics. <laughs> you take thermodynamics, you'll realize that's a vacuum inside. It's a Dewar flask. It's how the Yetis are made. And so they have a stainless steel double-walled glass, and they pull a vacuum in between so that there's no convection of the heat from the outside to the inside. So if there's no air in that gap, the only way to transfer energy is through radiation. So a lot of times they'll silver those. I love this door because it's not silvered. So it's letting infrared radiation, not much can get through the glass, but still it's letting the infrared from the hot glass on the inside go to the cold glass on the inside. And so that radiative transfer is not being stopped uh, by this door, but a lot of them have a silver coating that tries to stop that radiative transfer of heat. So that's the glass transition temperature. You saw that the that flexible polymer became uh, solid. Okay, <clears throat> we have the. We talked last time about the difference between natural fibers and semi-synthetics. So here, this, these are both chemically the same as cotton. So they're both carbohydrates. Uh, they're both uh, cellulosic materials, but the bottom one has been processed. It's the cellulose acetate fibers. And so let's talk about the different chain growth mechanisms and the forensic relevance of that. So here we have uh, in these synthetic polymers, different kinds of polymerization. We have some that are chain growth polymerization. You initiate it and then it naturally follows this chain growth mechanism. You have addition or step growth uh, polymerization, which forms water as a, as a product. And then you have this ring opening uh, polymerization, which you've heard of terms like epoxides and epoxies. Okay. So over here, this chain growth, we'll go through several of these. Now, Again, I'm not trying to um, turn you into a polymer chemist, but I want to, to point out that there might be some forensic relevance to uh, impurities in these different kinds of uh, polymeric materials. Now, there would be really small amounts, so trace evidence, but you know these initiators and catalysts are needed to start things off. And so these would be for forensically important impurities. So we'll, we'll look for these kinds of impurities in these different chain growth mechanisms as something that you might be able to, uh, you know, identify to to include or exclude sources of that polymer. So you've got, let's say you've got uh, two different polymers. One was made by anionic, anionic chain growth, and the other one was made by cationic chain, go, chain growth. Although the bulk of that polymer looks the same, the impurities may be different. Okay, so here's an example. So like this pre-catalyst is a nickel containing substance. And so there might be trace amounts of nickel in one particular uh, uh, type of polymer. It may be the same bulk polymer, but if it was grown a different way, one using a nickel catalyst, the other one not using the nickel catalyst, then you might have different trace elements. So these are the chain growth monomers. So what do they all have? I mean, they all have carbon. They're all carbon compounds, carbon-based compounds. Double bond. That double bond is what we're looking for. So how can we cause this double bond to propagate bonds to other double bonds? It's, it's pretty simple if we could just get the process going. So this is the idea. I'm just going to simplify it and draw double bonds like this. So if we had this situation... And we could do something to this double bond to where one electron went this way and the other electron went between the carbons. Remember the half-headed arrow, <laughs> right? Just single electron. Good job. Yeah, we're talking about organic. Okay. So then this, this is a chain reaction. So this forms, let's just put a radical on that one. Carbon, carbon, carbon. Okay. And a radical on that one. So we've we've split this little electron out here and split this electron out here and it made a bond in between. 
So this would be a very simple way to make a polymer. Anywhere there's a double bond, you could get them to hop and form bonds between the carbons. So this is our, this is the idea. Now we can do that by free radicals. We could do that by cations. So we could push, pull two electrons from one side and then you've got a bare carbon cation and then that double bond is attracted to the cation. We could push anions. So you could donate electrons and push anions and the anions would attack these exposed carbons. Okay, so we're gonna get into those, those mechanisms. But before we do, let's, let's learn the names of all of these different monomers. These are the, these are the commonest ones. <laughs> no, that's not a word, but it's good. Okay, so notice that the, the name of the monomer is in the polymer name. So ethylene is the name of the monomer. Do you see that? Even though technically it should be called ethene, it's just dated back to, you know, an older name convention. So it's polyethylene. And, and notice that the polymer doesn't have any more double bonds in it. So it's a little bit misleading, right? If you hear ENE, -E, you're going to think, oh, I've got a double bond. But in the polymers, it's polyethylene, but there aren't any double bonds because it's the name of the monomer. Okay. So it was a, a polymer, poly of ethylene units. So taking those ethylene units, polymerized them and, and made polyethylene. Okay, now here's another ancient name, okay? Vinyl, okay? So this is vinyl chloride. So the vinyl would be this, this ethyl group that's, a, that's an ethene molecule with some substituent on it, okay? And so that's vinyl chloride. If you put an acetate on there, it'd be vinyl acetate. So we see these this vinyl name is an ancient name for, for the ethylene. Okay, so vinyl is an old name for ethylene. And then the chloride, you got one chloride on there. Okay, and so you take that, that's where the double bond is. Notice it becomes a single bond between the carbons, but you've got these extra bonds here that are, that are bonding. And then you, you could draw your parentheses here and do a little N and show, yeah, there's N of those units to make the polymer. Okay, propylene. Now we're getting into something that's a little bit more more sane, right? Uh, propylene. We got propane has three carbons, one double bond. Now here's one that's a that's a common name, styrene. So notice we've got a lot of double bonds on this one. How is it that the that this is the double bond that does the polymerization? Why doesn't the aromatic ring polymerize? What makes it stable? You're on the right track. Resonance. Resonance, yeah. And so if I'm moving those double bonds around, is there a single double bond on that aromatic ring that I can attack? No, it's delocalized. So the aromatic ring is delocalized electron cloud, even though we draw three double bonds. And so it's that, that isolated or localized double bond between the two carbons that the, the aliphatic or, or olefinic, actually, the double bond that, that is the the active center for polymerization. Now, this is polystyrene. It's a, it's a, can be made into a, a clear, dense plastic. You're, this, y'all don't have CDs anymore. Everything's streaming. But the CD case was polystyrene, and that's a nice, clear plastic. Um, uh, but, you know, if you get acetone on it, like if you were like trying to remove a label or something from your CD case, and you use fingernail polish remover, it dissolves polystyrene, and so you wreck the whole case. And so you learn real quick in the 80s, don't do that. Okay. Um, and then if you blow foam in, like if while you're polymerizing it, if you blow it into a form with say CO2 or, or back in the day, chlorofluorocarbons, because it's an inert gas, uh, you can make styrofoam. So styrene, styrofoam is just polystyrene blown as a foam into a shape. And that's what our styrofoam is. Now, used to, like I said, the 80s and 90s, we were worried about the ozone hole, so they banned the chlorofluorocarbons. And this, at that time, the, the styrofoam was blown with the uh, chlorofluorocarbons. So the foaming agent was an ozone depleter. And so that's why everybody was like, ah, styrofoam's bad, you know, quit using it. Um, they started blowing it with CO2. And so this sort of lost, I mean, that it was not bad for the ozone hole anymore. It may be bad because it just generates polymer trash, but we have polymer trash in many different ways. So 
the but the original stigma from styrofoam was because it was releasing ozone depleters. So now it's just not biodegradable. So if we could get to biodegradable trash, that'd be even better. Okay, let's look at this one. Uh, Teflon is the is the trade name for this one, but it's tetrafluoroethylene. So you can look at this molecule. That makes sense, right? There's four opportunities to bond to those carbons, and all four of them are fluorines. So Teflon, tetrafluoro. Uh, ethylene uh, is poly polymerized to make Teflon. Now this one, the story goes, it was discovered accidentally. They were going to be doing uh, research. I, should, I need to look up what lab it was in. But anyway, they were doing research with these different gases and they bought a cylinder of tetrafluoroethylene. So they had a, a gas cylinder of this molecule and they get time for the experiment. They open the regulator. There's no pressure. And they're like, oh my gosh, we, we've leaked out all of this this compound in the lab, we didn't notice, okay? So they they thought that was strange. So they went and weighed the cylinder and no mass was missing, okay? So then they actually cut open the steel cylinder and they found Teflon inside. <laughs> it had polymerized and, and some of these gases will polymerize and, and sometimes they'll polymerize and generate an enormous amount of heat. So they'll they'll do what's called explosive polymerization. And on this, on this SDS sheets, the safety data sheets, you'll see for some compounds uh, a risk of exothermic polymerization. So uh, you want to be aware of that. Had happened with tetrafluoroethylene, and that's supposedly, that's the story I've heard of how it was discovered. Then you have acrylonitrile, okay? So here's, again, acrylic is another, another old name like vinyl. So you've got Acrylo, vinyl, ethylene, okay. Um, and then this is the nitrile group. So polyacrylonitrile um, can be spun into really strong fibers and, and you've, you've seen fabric maybe called Orlon or Acrolane. Um, we use those, uh, it's very chemically inert and so it's good, it's good, uh, makes good textiles. All right, then we have methyl methacrylate. Okay, and so here's the methyl group, and then again, the acrylate. So we have all of these different pieces, polymethyl methacrylate. That can be pressed into nice thick sheets. This is where we get plexiglass and lucite. If you make it thick enough, it can actually withstand bullets. And so a lot of our uh, bulletproof glass is really not glass. It might be a glassy state of this polymer, so technically it may be a, a glass, but it's not sand. Okay, that's been melted in the form. And then they have polyvinyl acetate or PVA. So know these, know these um, different monomers. Here's some more, okay? These are all different hydrocarbons. We've got iso, isobutylene and polyisoprene, okay? This, this one, again, finally we have one that's got multiple double bonds. And so... And, and polybutadiene also. So these are both active bonds. And notice in, in these, they, they end up with double bonds in the polymers. And then polychloroprene also. So these right here are very important for branching. Because after the polymerization takes place, you've still got double bonds that you can attach to. So those are very versatile starting polymers. And then you can start with poly like formaldehyde itself will polymerize. So just the, instead of the like ethene molecule, you could have a, um, this carbonyl and, and you can uh, polymerize that. Yeah, so so be able to like we did with the with the um, drugs and and everything. If you if you see the monomer and the names, can you match them up? Okay. So not drawing them from scratch, but but being able to to identify which polymer and name go together. Okay, let's talk about the different growth mechanisms. Okay. So here's anionic chain growth polymerization. So this is using acrylonitrile as an example, but we have this excellent initiator, uh, terp butyl lithium. Okay, so we have 
tertiary butane. And, and we've reacted this with, with lithium. So this carbon here has got five electrons, formal charge, right? So it's, it's negatively charged and it's coupled with lithium. So this is such a strong reactant that if you're gonna use this, put it in an organic reaction to get this started, you've got a bottle or what have you, um, it, it'll it'll just burn in air like if you take this and you use a syringe and, and put it try to put it into your experiment any drip on anything it's just going to be you're going to have a fire okay and there, there's a student that died they say they they were using it and then it, it caught it caught the reaction on fire and then it caught their clothes on fire and it burns they succumb to their burns this was uh, i think it was in california this famous famous case in terms of liability and so on um, you can take the syringe, I don't recommend it, but like in the hood, you squirt it right out into air and it's like a flamethrower. This stuff is so reactive. And so you put this into something with a double bond that that right there is going to attack this exposed carbon. So you've got this double bond here. It's going to come in and, and attach itself to that carbon. So you're going to form this butyl group, this, this single bond to the carbon. Because this butane, or you know, this this does not like to have a negative charge on it, and so that's a, that's a nucleophile. It's going to attack one of those carbons, and it's going to propagate. So now this carbon has got a negative charge on it, but it's a little bit bigger molecule, so it's a little more stable. And so then it's going to attack another carbon, and it's going to propagate. So that anion is going to propagate through all the double bonds and cause the polymerization reaction to go forward. Now. It could attack the carbon on the end, or it could attack this carbon in the middle. It's only got one hydrogen and the cyano group on it. And there'll be some preference to one or the other. That's where you need to take Hobbes's course to know which time, if, it, if, it's, if it's even, like if the reactivity of those two carbons is even, then you'll have a random polymer where uh, the, the cyano group will be on the front end or on the back end as it polymerizes. If there's a preference, then it'll be more of a homogeneous polymer, polymer type. Okay, this is um, similar to how the uh, chemistry of superglue works. I thought this was interesting that it was actually discovered twice. So in 1942, cyanoacrylates were discovered during World War II in a search for gun sight plastics. And so they wanted to find a, a, a plastic that they could glue the gun sights on because it'll stick to anything, okay? But the problem was it sticks to anything. So it was really hard to work with at the time. And so they, they abandoned it. Then they were re rediscovered in 51, um, doing research looking for polymers for jet canopies. And, and so finally they, uh, and by 1958, had figured out the commercial process for producing the cyanoacrylates and getting them into useful containers and so on. You know, it's it's interesting. You don't want a polymer that polymerizes immediately with everything because you can't store it, you can't use it. It's just as soon as you make it, it's done. It's totally reactive. Okay, so uh, it it reacts to proteins really well. Okay, and so what do you have in in your sweaty residues from your fingerprints? You've got some protein in there. That's that's the whole basis of ninhydrin. It develops with uh, its reaction to proteins, and then you can do a fluorescent image. Well, you could also have this cyanoacrylate vapor come in and it's gonna preferentially attach the proteins in the sweaty residues from your ridge line patterns. And then you can, uh, you can image that uh, and get contrast and get better images of fingerprints. Okay, let's look at cation chain growth polymerization. So now we need something that is electron deficient. The, the terp butyl lithium, the butyl part had extra electrons. It had more electrons than it wanted. The carbon had five electrons, it was negatively charged. So it wanted to attack a, nucleophile, uh, a, nu a nucleus, you know, it was a nucleophile. Now we have something that's an electrophile. So we have BF3, again, initiator catalyst. Is there any of that left in terms of its trace elements in this polymer? It's a, it's a, it's a good question. And so this is going to attack the double bond region and pull one of those bonds over. And so now you have this, this anion on the boron and this cation 
that's one one unit over. And so then this cation is going to attack the next double bond and push that cation forward. And so that's why this is a cation propagation. So the cations are moving and those are doing the, the polymerization. But we've got a different trace trace element. In this case, we've got a boron, we've got some fluorines. We don't have fluorines in this one here. We've got just, you know, butyl lithium. I don't know that there'd be any of the lithium left over, but we don't have any fluorines in this one. We don't have any uh, boron in this one. So you see how there might be some, some evidence left behind, some trace evidence in how that polymer was made. Okay, radical chain growth polymerization. So this one has an initiator. Typically it is uh, some sort of organic peroxide. Okay, this would be a little hard to detect, but still they may have some accelerators that they put in that have, uh, have metal centers and it's gonna produce these, these radicals. So this single electron is gonna come in and it's gonna bond or bring one of these single electrons over and then this single electron is gonna go on that carbon. Okay. And so this propagates the, the free radical. And so then the same thing happens. You've got this free radical here, one electron moves forward, one electron from the double bond moves over, you've got a covalent bond there, and then this electron moves onto that carbon. So you've got radical polymerization or radical propagation. Now, these propagating sites can quench. So this radical can come along here and combine with that one and make a covalent bond. And now we have a loss of our free radicals. So there's always this competition between new radical growth or quenching where they react with each other and stop the, the process. So you know, the, the polymer scientists would get in there and figure out how long the chains they want, and they would try to try to prevent uh, quenching if they if they wanted longer chains, or maybe they want short chains and they throw quenching agents at there, things that'll scavenge these radicals at the right time. And so this is a similar type of growth for, for polyethylene. And you can have polyethylene that grows uh, with lots of branching or with low, branch, low amounts of branching. And so when you have a long, long branches or, or, or less or fewer branches, then you can get to this high density polyethylene. If you have short branches, so lots of short branches like this one, then you have low density polyethylene. And low density polyethylene is soft, like this little grocery bag, and then high density polyethylene is hard. So these are the same polymer. This, this garden hose, pretty rigid, okay, it's high density polyethylene, and the, the low density polyethylene is, is really soft and flexible. A polyethylene is a great polymer. It's, it's, a carbon, it's, it's just a hydrocarbon, uh, but because it's just single bonds of all the carbons and the, and the hydrogens, it's pretty non-reactive. And so you can you know, restore lots of chemicals or have chemical exposure to a lot of the polyethylenes and it's gonna be fine. Let's look at ring opening. So these are the epoxides. So here's a propylene oxide, um, this ring here. And you can see that if you were to open that ring, so we have an initiator, this Lewis base, something with extra electrons. If it comes and attacks this corner of the ring, then it breaks right there and it opens up. So you see this RO right here is attacking this carbon here. It's opening up, we have this methyl. So see the oxygens on this central carbon and, and then it's ready to go again. So this, this now is the new RO, and it can propagate that way. Uh, if you want to propagate an anion, it can come in, and uh, if this, this opens up, you have these reacting with each other, and it, it shows this going to the center of the ring, but it, it's really hitting this centric carbon right there and bonding to that centric carbon. So both of these have that epoxide group. This is the origin of the term epoxy. So. Uh, a lot of times you have this reactive molecule separated from the base of the polymer. So you have, uh, you have the, the resin and you have the hardener. So this is the hardener, you have the resin that is a, like, a, it's, it's like a, it's already been polymerized to a certain amount, but it still flows. So it's not like a hard polymer. So you mix this hardener in with the resin 
and the reaction is going. And some of these have very specific windows of operating time. So you mix A and B together, you start stirring it together. The, the, you really got to stir it well together for it to make a good epoxide bond. Um, I was, I had a hole in the, in the wheel well of one of my travel trailers. We had a flat and the, the flapping of the tire ripped a hole in the plastic. So I had a gap about that big that I had to fill. So I've never used Bondo. So I went to the auto store, bought a can of Bondo. It's a two part epoxy. Okay. And you got two cans and you got this little mesh. So we, we taped the mesh on there and then we're going to mix part A and B. We mix it in a little uh, cottage cheese tub and it said working time, three minutes. Okay. And so I said, set the timer. So the sun sets in three minutes and I'm stirring, I'm stirring, I'm stirring. And I looked down and I said, how much time do I have? And he said, oh, it's like been two and a half minutes. And I was like, oh no. And so I started to like scrape the edges of the container and it all went and it hardened. <laughs> It was crazy. It was like three minutes. That's it. That's all you get. And I mean, I had the stick and this block of polymer on it. I mean, you could like still maybe squeeze it, but you couldn't spread it on any mesh. And it was done. And I was like, well, good thing I only used half, you know, so so we got the rest of A and B, mixed it in, and I like stirred for a minute and a half. And then I started spreading it on that mesh as fast as I could. And about three minutes, it was all lumpy and ugly, but it covered the hole. And so anyway. That's, that's my experience with epoxy. So they, they have these reaction rates down to a T. And so whenever you're at the hardware store, you see the epoxy, you know, you got the same product, like five different columns of A and B epoxies. Look at the time, because it's probably different amounts of accelerator they put in there. Again, that accelerator is probably going to be some differences in your trace elements. So then step growth polymerization. We see this a lot in the natural fibers, uh, but also in the, the synthetic fibers. And, and the most common ones are the, on the con condensation ones. So an amine and an alcohol will get together and they will, they will drop out water. So if we're looking at this, let's just look at this piece. We've got this, this H3N plus and this OH. So one of these hydrogens and this alcohol form the water. And then you have this nitrogen bonded to the carbon. And so you can see this is that nitrogen carbon bond. There's the NH2. Where'd the third H go? It went over here to the water. It took the OH off of that acid group. And so that would be the, um, the, the amino acid reaction. So acid and amine reacted. And it's a condensation reaction because it produces water. You can do the same thing with, with two acids. So you can have R... OH and HO R2. And so here's the water. You can pull that water out and bond that oxygen between the two acid groups. Okay. So that would be a that would be a um, basically a dehydration of, of the acid. Okay. And so all of these have some sort of product. Most of the time it's water. Sometimes it's an acid group like acid chlorides. Okay. And let's look at nylon. This is again, a, a, a way to use that condensation reaction to polymerize. Um, you can have one that has the kind of like amino acids. You have an amine on one end, you have an acid group on the other. You could uh, you could have a condensation reaction where the, the amide linkage is formed, just like it in our proteins, but it's not a protein, this is a synthetic polymer, okay? And so this is a, a polyamide. Now this is called nylon six because it's just one reactant. Down here, this is nylon six six, and it's because you have the hexane diamine and the dipic acid, so you have an A piece and a B piece. The A piece won't react by itself and the B piece won't react by itself, not, not very easily. But you mix A and B and you have this alternating polymer, A, B, A, B, A, B. And so that would be nylon six, six versus nylon six where you've got uh, a molecule that can react with itself. <clears throat> 
Okay, let's look at Kevlar. You've heard of Kevlar, it's an excellent fiber used for parachutes and paracord and also uh, some of the fabric used in, in bulletproof vests. And this is, the, the trade name would be Kevlar. The generic name would be Aramid. So where do we get this piece, Aramid? What do you think that stands for? Aromatic, very good. So we've got these aromatic groups. And then we have the amide linkages right here. And just like in our alpha helices or beta sheets for our proteins, we have interchain hydrogen bonding. I don't know that it's at this angle, but you see this interchain hydrogen bonding that provides that excellent strength between the chains. So this allows this particular polymer, if you spin it right to where you can have this interchain hydrogen bonding, to absorb a lot of energy in breaking those hydrogen bonds. You can break and remake the hydrogen bonds without breaking the molecule. So we're not breaking any covalent bonds, we're just breaking apart the hydrogen bonds and then they can snap back together. So that's what gives this uh, particular molecule a lot of strength. And then the aromatic rings can stretch too. So they have uh, a huge amount of strength in terms of not breaking. So they can bend and not break. So those, those uh, aromatic rings can absorb a lot of abuse. Okay, one of the, the main components that we've been using for years to produce these aromatic regions of our polymers has been bisphenol alcohol, bisphenol A. Okay, and you see this, uh, bis just means two, so it's two phenol, uh, groups added to this central methyl group and then you have the alcohols on the end and those are your reacting groups so you can react those with uh, with an acid and do a condensation reaction and so on uh, in this case it's reacting with phosgene really nasty chemical and so we're losing the, the chlorine and the hydrogen so those are coming off as hcl and leaving behind a link between the carbonyl and that oxygen so so this is the little phosgene piece right here. Okay, so this is a polycarbonate known as Lexan. A lot of our glasses are made out of this polycarbonate, but notice this, this uh, in particular, this piece right here. Um, that has received a lot of bad press. Um, and we'll see why in a second. So this bisphenol alcohol is, is you know, you see all of these compounds or, 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 or packaging uh, and it says BPA free and so it's not I, I thought there can't be that much BPA in like a little Tupperware that's going to get into my food that's going to make me sick I mean there's nothing about this molecule that looks incredibly toxic okay but it's because it's an estrogen mimic so it's messing with the the um, hormonal function in the body and so when I heard that I was like okay yeah we want to we want to be careful getting that into our food and, and this is, um, again, like if I were to try to block the lights out in this room, an acute toxin would be like smoke. So the toxin is the dose, right? The more smoke I put in the room, the dimmer it gets. But a hormonal way to do that would be to come over here and turn off the light. So that's how much the dose you need to make it dark if it's a hormonal situation. You turn off the endocrine system or it may be an allergy. Maybe your body is ready to go, and as soon as it gets an insult, a very small dose will cause your body to react. It's not that the compound is causing you is, is is needed for the function of your response. It's just a trigger. So once the allergen triggers your response, then your body has more than enough of its energy and so on to trigger the immune response. Uh, but the thing that triggered it can be incredibly small doses. Okay. Then we have this down here, this melamine molecule. It's been in the news. This is a crazy molecule. It's kind of like a benzene mimic, but with nitrogens on it. It can be polymerized with formaldehyde to form this network polymer or two-dimensional polymer. And it can make a really strong sheets like auto paint top coats. So this is a, a really strong polymer uh, again, it can take a lot of insult because because it's a two-dimensional matrix. It, 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 the insult on that polymer can go in multiple dimensions. It's not just focused on a particular 
single length of chain. Um, and this was put mixed into I am's pet food a few years ago. Um, so there was a company uh, that was providing the the protein material, the plant material that went into IAMS pet food. It had nothing to do with IAMS itself. It was their supplier from China. And this fellow was faking the protein test. So when you want to test for this feed that you're getting, you're buying, so Purina's buying, you know, a train car load of this feed, they'll pull it out and they'll do a protein test and say, yeah, that's high protein feedstock. We're going to mix that into our feed. Uh, well, the melamine was, was faking out the test. Look how much nitrogen is in the melamine. And so the, this protein test was testing for the nitrogen in the proteins, and it got fooled by the melamine. And it was going into pet food, and then we had just a rash of, in particular, dogs that I remember having kidney failure. And so people's pets were dying, and they were like, what's going on? And they traced it to IAMS. They traced it to a couple of other brand names, and they're like, well, this can't be in the individual company that's selling the pet food. It must be their supplier. So they ran it all the way up the train, and they found out it was the supply of feed that was coming from China. And the, the head of the company that um, that was doing the fakery, <laughs> Jing Zhao, got the death penalty okay, for this because he was, he was ahead of faking these tests. And, and anyway, it was a pretty big scandal. So 2007, pretty far back. Okay, let's talk about uh, polymer crystallinity. I always thought, I mean, I can see how a molecule like ice can crystallize, right? Because you've got a small molecule and you can make a little matrix. Uh, but how is this long, crazy chain polymer going to crystallize? And, and ethylene, what, what is it about like a polyethylene? How could that possibly crystallize? It's in such a simple shape like CH2s. And and CH2s, they don't hydrogen bond like water. So I could see very easily how water would crystallize in ice. You got all the hydrogen bonding network. If actually, if actually makes a, like a diamond structure. So diamond and ice have a very similar crystal structure. And that's why ice is unbelievably strong uh, for, you know, such a simple molecule. Uh, but you can have regions of crystallinity. So yes, you have a, a really crazy random looking polymer, but you can get these CH2 groups, let's say this is ethylene, the CH2 groups to sort of zip together. And that's the way I understand it. Think about how, um, how easy it is to break like just a single zipper bond. Like if I get two of those little zipper pieces to hook together, it's, it's pretty easy to break them apart. In fact, that's how the zipper mechanism works, right? It's, it's linking like two at a time or one at a time as it goes down. And then to unzip it, you're breaking them one at a time. Very easy to make and break. Not a lot of energy there. Just like two CH2s coming together in an alternating pattern, that's not a lot of energy. Okay? But you put enough of them together, and you can form a pretty hard zone of crystallization. Just like you put enough of those zippers together, and it's strong. Like if you just take something that's zipped and try to pull it apart, really hard to pull apart. But if you just unzip it one at a time, very easy to pull apart. So we don't want this typically because if, say, we make a, a nice dashboard for our car and then we start getting polymerization of the polymer of that dashboard, it forms, one, it consumes polymeric material. Notice how dense this is. So it's, it's like it's a vacuum. It's sucking polymeric material into the crystalline zones. What is that doing to this little chain right here? It's stretching it. You see how that's stretched out? The more crystallization I have, the more stretched these pieces become. And the more tense they become, and eventually they break, and eventually the polymeric material will crack. So crystallization is the enemy of a lot of substances we make out of polymers. If it crystallizes, then it can start to crack. And we you know, go get into an old car. What do you see on the dash? You see cracks. So how do we prevent this crystallization? We put in plasticizers. And so this dibutyl phthalate, okay, it's, it's got a lot of different ways to hydrogen bond. It's got some pieces here that can interfere with the crystallization. It's got some things that it can do to hydrogen bond with other molecules. It's got some strength from the aromatic ring. 
Um, it also makes it more soluble and more materials to have that ar aromatic ring. And so the plasticizers will get in there and they will disrupt this. So that's what Armor All is and this plastic um, stuff that you can spray on and rub into your polymeric materials to keep them from crystallizing and keep them flexible. So the plasticizers keep them from becoming rigid and from cracking. And, and a lot of this new car smell it's the plasticizers, okay? So even though it, you're like, oh, that smells so great, it's probably not that great. <laughs> you're breathing in all these bisphenol A type molecules, although we're trying to get rid of the, the BPAs. But yeah, it, you know, you might want to roll the windows down. <laughs> so, um, it's good for the polymers, but it may not be good for your body. I don't know. I don't want to cause people to freak out. But um, Toxin is the dose. It's not a hard, huge dose, but a chronic dose, who knows? Now that polymer processing, we can, we can, you know, take these pellets of polymers like this, put it in an auger bit, heat it up, spray it through a dye and make, make sheets like this. We can make threads like this. I mean, we can do all kinds of things. We can make fibers, um, spin it onto bobbins. We can sew with it. You know, we can make fibers that have crazy cross sections, ribbon polymers, uh, this, you know, crazy absorbent, you know, multi-component lobes of fibers. We can make little bow ties. Trilobe and, and hollow and, and round, these are these are probably the most common here, these three. And you can have a hollow core, you can have a, a, a filled core. And so these sheath and core types are on top. You also have trilobes. You have with really long lobes or just triangular, but they can get pretty complicated. Look at these down here. You know, these have got sort of, they're like tubes, okay? But even even the most complicated man-made polymer is still nothing like the natural complexity in hair. So that's, that's it for our polymer lecture. Let's play with the liquid nitrogen.